in some ways that I feel like that could come out of Joe Biden's mouth like verbatim. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, Kyle called sure. that early. 18th, 18th Brevere, baby. Joe Biden. 18th Brevere of Joe Biden. <laughs> 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 Hello and welcome to the 22nd episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon reading group series. Today is Thursday the 11th of February 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue on our merry way through chapter 6 the victory of Bonaparte. This week I have the new patron, Dynamic Kazai, to thank. If you like the sound of extra Patreon-only episodes and live streams, want to help keep the lights on and the episodes flowing, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. This episode was edited by my comrade Jack from Auxiliary Statements, so go check out Jack and Dan's podcast. That's Auxiliary Statements. Thank you, comrade Jack. Okay, let's jump straight back in to chapter six. Kyle, you're you're uh, our resident bloviator. Is that the no, no, that is an insult? Good reader. There we go. Now, do you want to start? <laughs> Actually, <with> speaks <laughs> French. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's what Tom means. <laughs> that's that's direct that's translation. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, the department councils, those provincial representative bodies of the big bourgeoisie, which met from August 25th on during the recess of the National Assembly declared almost unanimously for revision, and thus against Parliament and in favour of Bonaparte. Still more unequivocally than in its falling out with the parliamentary representatives, or with its parliamentary representatives, the bourgeoisie displayed its wrath against its literary representatives, its own press. The sentences to ruinous fines and shameless terms of imprisonment on the verdicts of bourgeois juries for every attack of bourgeois journalists on Bonaparte's usurpationist desires, for every attempt of the press to defend the political rights of the bourgeoisie against the executive of power, astonished not merely France, but all Europe. While the parliamentary party of order, by its clamor for tranquility, as I have shown, committed itself to quiescence, while it declared the political rule of the bourgeoisie to be incompatible with the safety and existence of the bourgeoisie by destroying its own hands in the struggle against the other classes of society, all the conditions for its own regime, the parliamentary regime, the extra parliamentary mass of the bourgeoisie, on the other hand, by its servility towards the president, by its vilification of parliament, by its brutal maltreatment of its own press, invited Bonaparte to suppress and annihilate its speaking and writing section its politicians and its literati, its platform and its press. So it would then be able to pursue its private affairs with full confidence in the protection of a strong and unrestricted government. It declared unequivocally that it longed to get rid of its own political rule in order to get rid of the troubles and dangers of ruling. And this extra parliamentary bourgeoisie which had already rebelled against the purely parliamentary and literary struggle for the rule of its own class and had betrayed the leaders of this struggle, now dares after the event to indict the proletariat for not having risen in a bloody struggle, a life and death struggle on its behalf. This bourgeoisie, which every moment sacrificed its general class interests, that is, its political interests, to the narrowest, and most sordid private interests and demanded a similar sacrifice from its representatives, now moans that the proletariat has sacrificed its ideal political interests to its material interests. It poses as a lovely creature that has been misunderstood and deserted in the, the decisive hour by the proletariat, misled by socialists. And it finds a general echo in the bourgeois world. Naturally, I do not speak here of German shyster politicians and riffraff of the same persuasion. I refer, for example, to the already quoted economist, which is as late as November 29th, 1851, that is four days prior to the coup d'etat, declared Bonaparte to be the guardian of order, but Trier and Bellier to be anarchists 
And on December 27th, 1851, after Bonaparte had quieted these anarchists, is already vociferous about the treason to the skill, knowledge, discipline, spiritual insight, intellectual resources, and moral weight of the middle and upper ranks, committed by the masses of ignorant, untrained, and stupid proletaire. The stupid, ignorant, and vulgar mass was none other than the bourgeois mass itself. <laughs> I love us. Dang. I love us. I really love, like... The Economist calling Trier like an anarchist. Oh my god! After like you know the July like eighteen thirty you know revolution was was squashed and he was put in as like the lead figure. I don't know, like it just God. You can really feel the derangement. Like we're always looking for parallels between this and that, like this time and that and and that time that the time we're in and the time we're reading about. And the more I read about this, eh, like it seems like the cl- the way the class forces stack is very different. But what isn't different is total bourgeois derangement, and that's that's very entertaining. Yeah, you know what's interesting to me about this because this is a text that I actually think a lot about. Is like you know we get Bonapartism obviously comes from this text, right? But like, do we have a good theory about why this happens so often? Like a good humanist, but functional, structural, I'm going to say functional, structural, not to be confused with Althusserians, functional, structural theory of of what all this means. Like why this happens so much. I mean, the, th- the weird thing, for example, in America, this, this does happen, but it does, ha- it only seems to happen like in cycles of like 90 years, like every, I guess maybe Reagan is this light, but it wasn't like it, you don't see the kind of stuff that you see now where you actually have like open corruption and courts and stuff like they're describing here. And we have stuff like that. I was talking last night with Esri about how, like, I was just trying to sound out, like, what the differences are and what the similarities are. One of the differences is that, like, when I think of the people who support Trump now, for example, I think of, of the petite bourgeois largely. Because, uh, you know, w- based on what I've read recently, it seems like a lot of the big bourgeois are supporting Biden. But then I really thought about it, like, one of the key differences now is, is like, how big the petite bourgeois is compared to how big it was here in the time of this test. And I think one of the big differences in my experiences of living in, like, rural Arizona and living in uh, Phoenix, you know, the more urban part of Arizona now, is that I think it's a a divide between rural and urban uh, PBs, right? Because... You get like the guy who owns the mechanic shop out in like the outskirts who also works there. And he's talking about how like, he doesn't even like really care that much about Trump or politics. He just like wants things to be calm so they can work and make money. That's it. He wants to keep, keep, you know, care of his family. And he's like, you know, buys into all the scaremongering about protesters. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, you get, kind of like urban hipster PBs who, you know, want to make a big show of supporting Black Lives Matter so that they don't get their doors kicked in and they can maintain business, you know? Yeah, I I guess maybe that's a long way of saying that we don't have like a humanist structural functional, like good theory of Bonapartism, but like it's just sort of like reappearing tendencies that like affect different parts of the bourgeoisie in different ways. I don't think it's it's a rational process either because like, the, what what ends up happening here is that the bourgeois outside of politics, some some form of it, whether it's PV or not, the bourgeois outside of politics wants to end its political representation and just allow a strong man to get shit to run, right? To make the trains run on time, to make sure they could get their goods and services done. That's it. And I think what it boils down to, maybe the structural kind of theory behind this is the, the, the process of political management distracts from the process of profit making. So, so actually, I, there is a person who has a theory on this, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to state it, but it's not a Marxist theory. It is a class theory. It's not a Marxist theory. There's the <laughs> kind of center liberal-ish. You, sometimes he's kind of on the conservative side. Right now he's actually flirting with social Democrats. Michael Lind. And Michael Lind has a theory of what he calls the overclass, which is PB small level professionals and then large professionals who serve the bourgeois. 
and he he basically says that left if you look at left liberalism in America and right and conservatism right liberalism in America you have the PB who who are being proletarianized and ironically because they're being proletarianized they're actually hostile to state intervention because anything on the tax margin actually reduces their profits significantly because they are subject they are being subjected to declining profit rates in a bigger way whereas these larger more professionalized areas have monopoly capital pull and all these servicing areas, they're actually going to be very amenable to the state taxing high because they need it and they're willing to pay it to keep their jobs because the cost payoff is better. But that, to me, that explains now in the United States and we can remark, we can remarxify that if we want to. I think there are ways to do that. But that dynamic didn't entirely exist in France at the time. And so I can't use it to retroject back to then, except that there does seem to be some issue between the the rural and urban class interests that we don't deal with that, that, that goes back to even before this, goes back to the 1848 revolution, because you could get even the proletariat in the rural areas to kind of side against the urban proletariat consistently. Well, I was going to say that, yeah, more or less the same thing, that my intuition as to why the PB is going for Trump for, you know, sort of in the most obvious way, whereas the big bourgeoisie, like I, I was reading recently about the way in which the sort of classic Bush bourgeois voter or the people in big energy and oil, the blue chip stock owners or, or executives in America are, are going Democrat in a big way. They're going for Biden, and the Biden strategy has been very successful in, in courting that that demographic. Is that yeah? Like the PB have much smaller reserves and are, are just in a a much more precarious position than the big bourgeoisie, as you were saying, like monopoly capital, quote unquote. They don't have the reserves to ride this stuff out, or they're they're afraid they don't have the reserves that, to ride this stuff out. Whereas the big bourgeoisie are like, eh, like yeah, there's unrest, but the the sort of big unrest of mismanagement is a bigger threat to them or a bigger annoyance to them than the uh, unrest on the streets. That doesn't, that doesn't matter so okay. much to them. So like the big bourgeoisie at this time yeah. were less established, had yes. less like kind of had less reserves. Like they hadn't completely displaced the aristocracy in, in an important way. And then 200 years later, those people are basically fine and they can run companies that aren't profitable for 15 years or something and just be fine. Is that, yeah. is that what yeah, I'm hearing? That's part of it. I mean, when, you know, I've been doing all this. I don't know. I've been doing all this study on like the, the, the relationship between the bourgeoisie's of monopoly capital and social Democrats mistaking monopoly capital for another podcast who I won't name t so that uh, Tom won't rant about it. And I've also been doing, you know, I'm writing a book on Christopher Lash, who was pointing out some of these problems actually in the 60s, that there's a tendency of left liberals as early as the 1950s to, in America, to try to uh, promote monopoly capital. And he went through and, and showed that this was a tendency going back to Roosevelt because the laissez-faireism had... Like true laissez-faire economics in America had failed in the long depression, like as early as 1890, like really. And we haven't really done true laissez-faire since and neoliberalism is not true laissez-faire. I mean, like anyone who studied it knows that. So it's, we're in this period where there's been a shift, but what's interesting about like reserves, right? Both, if we look at real reserves, Nobody right now actually has reserves. What monopoly capital has is political clout because if they fail, you have social collapse. Right. But they do have reserves. Like a lot of these big IT companies have massive reserves. Yeah, like but IT Apple doesn't has, really run. Has a trillion dollars in, in reserves sitting. Loads of the big corporations have. have How much have of that is fictitious reserves. capital, though? It's yeah, a lot of that's finance. The, no, a lot of like that the, is a lot earnings. Of that is like a, a lot of financial, like no, a lot of that is earnings. It's where they place their earnings. Like you know, like even we're talking about ones like they're placing their earnings made on monopolies. So like Apple and the iPhone, they're okay. they're they're storing their profits 
like literally yeah, very, in, in hedge funds in Ireland. That's what they're doing. Before very tippy top of the pyramid, you're correct. For the entire rest of the big bourgeoisie, eh. Also, what you're describing, by the way, are companies that live off monopoly IP, which are rents. They're not actually living off of commodity production in a real way. They're not living off real exactly. commodities. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I said that explicitly. But like, right? So but I, that, but like, the, the, the real commodities still drive the economy. You can't do that on a non-commodity economy. Like, there's no way to do that. I, know, I don't know why. I don't really deny, but like, I'm not you're denying that you're. You're getting it from somewhere in the world system, but you don't care where it's coming from. But they are, right. they, they have them. And the big monopoly powers like Google and Facebook and these, you know, these, they have loads of money sitting there. I think that's why, like, I, I think, I nearly look at what you guys are, guys and girls are saying is that I look at it the, nearly the opposite of what Kyle was saying. I think, like, if you're a petty bourgeois, you're a, a shop owner on the street somewhere in America and all this protesting is going on and you don't want that protesting and you want like things to go back to normal, you're more likely to get a, a, a at least a temporary return to normality through Biden. I don't, I, I don't see that the vote for Trump has been somehow trying to get over this short term and, and get all, get this, get the stuff done or anything. I don't see that has been a, a rational decision. It, 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 it. It depends on where you're at in the United States. That's why the rural urban stuff is really important. Like, I actually do think that's a dynamic that most people who don't live in the States kind of miss. Uh, the Biden economy would be a return to a normal petite bourgeois economy. And most of those people, like most of the shop owners here are probably Democrats. Like when you when you look, however, at the at the at the rural and ex-urban economy, that economy is more decimated. The tax structures are more a threat to it because because they have lower profit margins. And I don't really buy the cultural thesis that it's all just it's all rural conservative culture buying it, because honestly, in America right now, if you look at the working class, that's more conservative and you break it up by race. What race is going to be the what race is going to be the most culturally conservative? It's not white people. It's, it's actually mostly new Latino immigrants, but they're yeah, not. Exactly. But they're not they're not voting. They're not voting cultural conservative. They're not. They're either not voting or they're voting with on Democrats because th their economic interests override their cultural concerns. And I think for most people, that's true. So what explains the, the petty bourgeois Trump stuff, if, if only they're going to get tax cuts that they think they won't get from the Democrats? Yeah, it's, it's largely that, because we think about it, like when we're talking about the rural, like petite bourgeois, we're talking about petite bourgeois in what could be considered the periphery of within this country, right? So like they have a lower income base and so taxes, which generally Democrats have a higher tax base will decimate them more. Whereas, you know, it doesn't affect as much. If I'm understanding Derek correctly, I think yep. that's basically correct. And also so they're in a, a higher tax bracket too. In America, for example, if you're a mm -hmm. low income, but a business owner, Mm -hmm. You get hit harder by yeah. taxes than the big bourgeoisie do. The big bourgeoisie right. will actually sometimes even call for higher taxes. The really big bourgeoisie, and here I'm yeah. not even talking about Google and whatnot. I'm talking about mm -hmm. the investor class, like Berkshire right. Hathaway, and the people who, if they didn't give their money away, would still be the richest people in America. They, they call for this because they, they know they can take it. They're yeah. actually somewhat concerned about the, about the nature of the tax structure in America falling disproportionately on a group that's going to become super reactionary. I mean, I remember um, Warren, not, not Elizabeth Warren, uh, Warren Buffett. <laughs> Warren Buffett. Yeah. I, I call him uncle Warren. Cause I worked for him for, in, a, in the early <laughs> aughts. Um, were you, a rent, uncle were you a rent boy? Um, so, <laughs> sort of. Um, good old uncle Warren. I was an insurance salesman. Uh, <laughs> good old uncle Warren. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we got to prosecute ourselves out for something, right? Um, so, sex work. We got to sex work ourselves for something. Okay, we're refined individual. I'm sick. Of, I'm sick of a red boy for Derek. For Derek, it's red boy. Yeah, for Derek, the politically correct term is red boy. All right. So, um, so the the uh, you you see these calls because I think I think Warren Buffett understood as early as the the the, the early Bush administration. That this was going to destabilize his investment or order, because because populism. I mean, my, uh, again, I'm Brent Michael M. Michael M. has a quote that populism has to be will always become reactionary over time because it is always reacting. It has a very basic 
it has a very simpleton economic understanding of economic interest. It does actually have one in some ways more, more, more immediate and visceral than Marxists do, but it's very like one-to-one. Um, if you read again, I hate to be pimping Christopher Lash's early work, but Christopher Lash in the agony of the American left actually spells this out, traces how the, like when the American left went from, from populism to Marxism and why, and why, why populism started getting into weird conspiracy theories and, and co- which, which by the way are rapping on the left and right right now, as we were talking about before the show, which is a sign of degeneration why all that's happening is that you, you don't really, it's, it's an, that's always an inherently reactionary thing. It might not be reactionary in the sense that it always goes right wing, but if you're, uh, if you, you just want to break so that you can quit hemorrhaging your profits, you want two things. You want deflation and you want low taxes and in, Three percent inflation, moderated inflation, has been liberal monetary policy across the board by the establishment for forever. Um, forever being back into the late sixties, if I'm really going to be honest. And tax rates that are really actually kind of nice if you're super rich, but really hard on you if you make say between sixty and ninety thousand dollars a year, particularly if you make it self-employed, because you're going to get hit by um, self-employment tax. It, it, it's 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 a reactionary feature that I don't think Marxists right. really look at because we kind of we, we kind of give liberal liberal hopes on tax structure passed. Remember at this time, this is a time period where Marx was like speaking out against the income tax, even after he advocated it in the manifesto. Like he was speaking out against it at this time for those reasons. Yeah, this is in uh, liberal talking points in progressive circles known as the, the middle class tax burden, right? Like. Of course, liberals want to, you know, up progressive income tax and, you know, whatever, like, however you want to actually solve that problem, you know, when you actually look at tax structure, that is the bump that you tend to be, you tend to see there's disproportionate taxes on those small bourgeoisie, which kind of drive them wild. But I don't know. Here, the petty bourgeoisie again, are the, what were they like, the social Democrats, Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. um, and so that's very different. I guess if we're, if we're tracking our situation and the situation here and we want like some general kind of like structural functional theory, like I guess the, bi- the big factor is the displacement of aristocracy by big bourgeoisie. Well, however you want to fra- frame it. Going from formal to real subsumption, you know, whatever, like the, the setting in of, of capitalism as the ancien regime like in a, in a big formal, you know, centuries long way. So we shouldn't expect this to map directly on to now, even, you know, because we don't have that same dynamic. No, uh, I think but- that what we see right now <laughs> is in America, it's like the agenda of the party of order is kind of split. So you listen to what people are saying on Wall Street and they're fed up with Trump. They, they, they find his just sort of mercurial randomness infuriating because they don't know how to place bets. They don't know what's going to happen because Trump is so unpredictable. And so actually Trump for them does not represent order, right? It, he, he represents chaos and they don't want that. So they want Biden because he's going to bring order. And, you know, it's partially the same thing for sort of the, the blue chip CEOs. They also just find Trump to be distasteful. Uh, like we don't do politics that way, you know, kind of never Trump stuff. And they're going to Biden for that. But when it comes to the question of the party of order cracking down on protests in the streets, Biden is trying to make himself credible on that point. But Trump is pushing harder on it and is actually doing the same thing we see here where, like, the economist is calling Trier an anarchist, right? Like, he's <laughs> he's saying that Biden is secretly being manipulated by communists, right? right. Like, you know, that kind of slander is, is, is in the air. So I think the, the party of order agenda is split here. We see the sort of, like, regulating the economy – creating financial stability being claimed by Biden. And then the question of law and order punishment is more being claimed by Trump. And then when you look at the question of 
who controls the state and regulation. Maybe it's the case that, yeah, the, the petty bourgeoisie in these uh, ex-urban and rural areas see with Trump that they might have a chance to wrest some regulatory and state power out of the hands of the people who usually control it, which is the big bourgeoisie and, you know, yeah. the clients of the Democratic Party to some degree, right? So, but, but yeah. Kyle, opposed to that last bit you're saying, like, Trump has just handed the keys over to the big corporations. It's not like he's had mom and pop stores do give them the keys. He's done, he basically is, you know, he's got all the same Wall Street hacks in there. He does, uh, but, but he supports tariffs, which is, which is not, which is something that mm -hmm. also has a lot of say with these rural exurban petite bourgeois. Um, he supports a very punitive immigration regi regime, but that still pro but still does allows a lot of people in, believe it or not. And that's because that gives a lot of like the, the, the ranchers and stuff a lot more control as long as ICE doesn't overstep their bounds, which occasionally they do. And then the ranchers turn back to start considering the Democrats. I've actually seen that happen. I, you know, out here in the West, it's a much liver issue. The thing that I think that we, we have to like grok a little bit about the dysfunction of, of order right now is a party of order. I don't want to sound like a deep state conspiracist. But there is a sense in which, like, the mainstream is the party of order, and it is a bipartisan right, right. functionary consensus of yeah. which they have believed, yeah, we'll let you have your Bernie and whatever as long as you don't actually win. And we, we go to sensible – and we'll even, we'll even find the most we'll, – we'll find the most progressive pearl cop – you know, person of color. I, I it, this was hilarious that someone said this. This was a liberal said it. I think on the, on the Slate Political Gab Fest or whatever that like, Mike Pence and Kamala Harris are actually like the perfect median, upscale um, version of the voter block for their constituencies. Like you'll see a return to cultural war politics stuff. I mean, and in some ways, Biden's both. Biden, the BLM stuff, and this is where I'm going to sound super cynical, is really good for Biden in a lot of ways because you can crack down mm -hmm. on it and appease it at the same time. Yeah. This, like, it's Iran Obama and Occupy. Exactly. Obama and Occupy well, all over. Yeah, yeah. but I ironically, though, like, yeah, there is, like, an appeal that, you know, some people think that Trump's going to bring order. But the funny thing is, like, Democrats are running one of the most, like, racially charged pro-cop tickets that they have in, like, a very long time. Yeah. During a, you know, militant black response to the Trump administration, partially in hopes of flanking Trump to his right and appealing yes. to law and order. And yeah. so that, that's they, like they, the kind of funny thing about that, that like this, this they're the, the way that the narrative is unfolding right now. They're trying to coalesce a party of order ticket. Like right. they want uh, the, the suburban Republicans to come to them and create a grand coalition in the name of order right uh that's their strategy yeah trump's strategy is for every every one of those republicans the the, the, the democrats get i'll get uh, a couple of more racists <laughs> that, that's his strategy well i mean i think well, I, the other thing is you like you can look at tr trump's law and order strategy it actually deliberately creates chaos 100%. Right. and so it is a strategy based on exacerbating the fears of rural and urban tensions in a way that like actually is is destabilizing in a big big way and it's talked about all the time and like centrist circles both right and left about how how i mean like otherwise the fucking lincoln project wouldn't be a thing like you want to talk about the party of order like the fact that like not only has Ber the whole Bernie DSA movement become irrelevant, that we're literally in a world where like, the political landscape seems to be between the Lincoln Project and QAnon. Right. That's a classic. That's a classic uh, Bonapartist move, though. Right? Is is provoking provoking chaos so as to uh, move in to uh, stop it? Yeah, and I, I would think there's there's also Derek when we're talking about that concept of folding, like you know this kind of uh, contradiction of the Biden that he'll attract the be the law and order candidate and also appease the Black Lives Matter thing at the same time. But I, I, that trick that Obama did with like Occupy, I feel your pain, and now hits him over the head. <laughs> now I feel how I see your pain even more of it. But like I I don't know if that. 
I, I don't I, I think that that Biden will not be able to fold in that into the same way as Obama did. I think that the class situation and you know everything that's gone on since it was will make this him unable to do that. So I do not I think that's what it is kind of maybe confusing the bourgeoisie a bit. They don't seem to have an obvious good route at the moment. No, but well, it think... seems like there's a precedent for whenever like a, a center left kind of party or even like a social democratic or communist party tries to flank the right from the right, they trip on the way and fucking fail, right? Like that seems to be the thing. Now, there's a lot about this that is a lot of bets are off right now, I would say politically. So I wouldn't be like super surprised if Biden could pull it off. But I I think there's a lot about Biden that people are just not excited about for a lot of different reasons. And they're kind of, as far as like engagement with like their base, like they're kind of just like relying on the fact that he was the VP for Obama and liberals love Obama. So maybe that will work. Well, I mean, maybe like, maybe if Biden calls in, you know, the military on protesters, the military would listen. Like that's the, that's the the major, (laughs) I feel like at this point, you know, that and feeling more woke about it because you get the you know, black lady cop VP, like, the, like those are the twin appeals there. Is well, that you, you can also crush like, the black militant movement and do woke politics at the same time, right? The you also part- literally get Obama. Yeah, like Obama yeah. is like the shadow member of the ticket. Right. Yeah. Also, you have really the black and POC developing upper middle class can actually stake the terms of BLM and crush its own militancy and save itself which is something that is not addressed enough. And they are able to do that under a Democratic ticket more easily. They were able to do it under Obama, not during Occupy, but during the first round of BLM itself. Moving BLM into the colleges is, you know, uh, is a great thing for them. And you, you, you start seeing people talk and, you know, not against like police abolition or police abolition becomes really abstract. They start talking about diversifying the FBI. That is what happened in BLM Lam <laughs> 1. I, mean, I, I use that because I, I saw it. Like I, I saw it happen. No, wrong. And so yeah. like, like that tactic, I think the other thing is though, I think we have, we're still thinking in terms of like the next six months. When I think in the terms of this, I think we're going to watch Biden screw up. Like, wins or loses, I'm not, I'm also personally not want to put money down on either side right now, even though, like, Same. It, it does tell me that this, the conditions match up with the few times that an incumbent have lost historically in America. But I also think if you look at the other times this has happened, the Biden, Biden will not have a long presidency. And I think the idea, that, I mean, Biden's idea, I think, is even to like, I'm going to step down and we're going to, you know, we're going to rush uh, Kamala Harrison and it's going to be easy as an extension of the presidency. And that probably will fail. And and so we're still in, you know, even though this has become a right wing metaphor, we're still in the Bonapartist clown world's repercussions. <laughs> like, and, and the last time this happened, it lasted from 1968 until 1980 and the restorer of the new order was a shift in the right from the Rockefeller Republicans to the Schlafly Reagan Republicans. And so like many things like Occupy was the end of like a kind of anarchism, for example, this is the end of something else. I think this is the end of that. What, what comes next? We got no idea. And, and so, and I think we don't know either way if Trump, if also Trump wins, I have no idea what the Democrats roll out next. I have no idea what Republicans roll out next. There's no, there's no, there's no national figure that's a clear analog to Trump. There isn't one. Uh, the Republicans are expecting that if if Trump loses, you're going to see someone, you're going to see doubling down on right wing politics, and someone even more repugnant is going to be <laughs> in the charge of that party. Who knows if they'll actually have any political support. The only person that could recapture the magic is Kanye. Like, that's that's <laughs> the only person... I, I'm serious. That's the only person that comes to mind that could pull off the right amount of, like, Twitter celebrity and, like, sort of, you know, left field, like... Kanye kind of 2024. Let's do this. Reactionary kind of uh, vibe. Seriously. He could do it. He's, like, people laugh at Trump. Exactly. Like, Kanye, he may have manic depression or something like... but. 
he could fucking do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, re- the last, the last thought. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Cross no, talk. And then last I last thought. Then we'll right, get just, back to the text. Yeah. Cause I just wanted to say the last thing about this is that as the really funny thing about the bourgeoisie after having sacrificed its general class interests, which is to say it's political interests to its most sordid uh, private interests and most narrow interests now demands that the proletariat fight and die for them. <laughs> and that they've been, they've been tragically misunderstood and misled by the socialists away from defending the bourgeois general class interest. And it's just such a funny, that's, I don't know. Like there's again, Marx is back with the wit in the pen here. And that's just a very funny line. Of course, in the next line, he talks about German shysters and riffraff, but you know, it's, what, what, what do people think about that? Like for like how the socialists in America are now going like, fuck Biden. I'm not voting for him. It's kind of like a similar kind of <laughs> dynamic, isn't it? You're stuck yeah. between a rock and a hard place. You're going to go, you can't win. Yeah. You like by not voting or voting for it's all the fucking same. Right. It's, tra- it's a tragic, we're, you know, being the proletariat being tragically misled by the socialists into not oh, voting, say, not voting blue, no matter who. Yeah. They sad. say shit like that. Sad. They say shit like that all the time. You know what? F- yeah. I don't know. The thing is that they don't vote already. Like, no, that's, <laughs> that, 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 this is nothing new. That's, it's, that's they don't need the socialists to tell them to not vote. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's, <laughs> the socialists desperately want them to vote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually. That's uh, oh, dear. The socialists are the ones fucking voting for the Democrats. That's the yeah. sickness of the whole fucking thing. Well, yeah, like, Ultimate those are the money. people that are being browbeaten right now, right? Blue, like, with the blue no matter who line is, is like, is That's, is folks like us, you know? Mm-hmm. Don't give it to them. And I'm in I'm in the UK. How am I supposed to vote for him? I don't get it. Now, like, uh, I, I think that I think that uh, browbeating is not working to the same extent from what I can see from over here. No, I don't but, think um, it is either. But I, I mean, they, they, they obvious like the party itself obviously doesn't give a shit. It's it doesn't give a shit. It's, 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 it's just such a, it does act. No, they don't. They don't care about the socialists. They really don't. <laughs> they, they do. Like you look at what their strategy is, and it has absolutely nothing to do with getting Bernie's vote. Right. It's, it's no. just not their oh, strategy. Yeah. The, the oh, Bernie yeah. Crats are totally soul broken in a way that even in 2016, there was still like a spark of like, you screwed us. We're angry. We're mad at you. We'll be back. This time, this time it's it's brutal. That's why we put in that Jacobin magazine ad in the uh, cognitive dissonance, uh, Bernie defeat, like issue is because like, there's a dead end there. I feel like that's why you see a lot of the Bernie Kratz that like, like they either have like a really deep break, the sort of Virgil Texas sojourn through Twitch and that sort of stuff, mm. or they they're going hard anti eyed Paul. Like you ruined this for us. Right. Like see, I'm yeah. still stuck in 20, 2016. I'm going to double down on logic, bro. And it's all the Chinese right. fault now. Like, yeah, and, and even, even like we, like, like the, the amount of people I hear from that spear talking about red Brown alliances, seriously. And, um, and like, def- and like, and like defend and like defending Trump as like, at least he's not starting new wars. Social That's, fascism, but actually, yeah, like, I mean, you know, the funny thing is you want to talk about left, right, pincer moves that don't work. That has failed every <laughs> yeah. single time. Like, well, one, one thing, like, yeah, I'd like to say as well is like, you know, when we did all the revolutionary strategy, and like, I was certainly thinking through the stuff about like, you know, taking over the Labour Party or taking over this. It, like, those things don't ever fucking work, you know, yeah. unless it's until we build our own institutions. All of this other stuff is all this bourgeois politics stuff is. Just bullshit. Don't just let people represent you, man. Like that's welcome. <laughs> welcome to the dark side. Yeah, Tom. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was always there, but I was kind of trying to like fucking think it through as well, you well, know, and give, was... it the, give it the experience. But it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. No, there, there was something happening. Like I was, I, was... I corresponded with a member of uh, Endnotes, who I won't like name, who was telling me that the struggle within the Labour Party was the struggle of a generation. And I didn't know how to respond. I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get back. I'll get back to them eventually. But I was, I was just sort of frozen. Like, what the fuck's happening here? Like, what did they mean by that? When you say the struggle is generating, they actually meant it was a big fucking thing that's going on in it. 
Yeah, and I feel like it was sort of a, a hallucination in the desert, seeing an oasis, because you live in Brighton or in o Oakland or Brooklyn or in a sort of like, you know, lefty sort of kombucha stronghold or something. <laughs> like, and you see that there is like some kind of, you see that there's some kind of like hipster popular movement or something, all right? Like you see that there's any motion at all inside a mainstream party in a way that we've never seen. Like, I mean, we haven't seen anything this big in, I don't know, in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, you know, you can really get swept up in the momentum because some form of localism, if you're in one of those areas at just the standard kind of anarchist localism and working with what's there, you know, there were campaigns in those places, right? And so I could see how somebody in that situation could get swept up, but it was just one of those sort of like, like brain blow, blowing a gasket kind of things where, uh, yeah, it's yeah. Like I, especially when I was more of a Leninist, I, I would always smirk and be like, <laughs> these autonomous, they're just social Democrats in waiting. They're just two sides of the same coin. And there's a way in which that's correct, but like that actually still doesn't give you like an answer, right? Like <laughs> feels bad. Feels bad. Yeah. <laughs> Feels bad. Like man, all the Leninists in in London, in England, I would think most of them went in for Corbyn as well. Let's be honest. It, yeah, it wasn't just communizers. No, no, no. Of <laughs> course, the whole left. That's something that might be a little different between the United States and the UK. Is that like the Leninists would go will go for Bernie, and there is like a, a section of like Biden Leninists or something. But like really, Len the whole like. Leninist political identity here is an attempted response to the failure of Bernie. Like, right. and, you know, people realizing that that's not going to work and trying to form some United Red yeah. Army cult in right. order to flee from the reality well, that, that, a, that there's yeah. no institutional mm -hmm. option. It also has the fact that, that uh, Chinese government actors have Twitter. I'm, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm, I know, not, I, I'm I, not kidding. So, I, I know you're not kidding, but <laughs> that doesn't account for like the MLs that are like, that's not real socialism. You would trade right. socialism in 1980. Yeah, there's but there's not many universal health care. There. But there's not many of them left. If you look at the largest like anti-revisionist yeah. parties, yeah. They, they're mostly Gist adjacent now. I, I mean, feel like, like it's changed in the last couple of years. I used to see so many of the anti-revisionists hated G, and now they all have gone in for... There's like a few holdouts and that's it. Like you, you're a settler if you hate if you hate on G. Yeah, you're basically a tribe. <laughs> like, not seriously. It's yeah. like a settler for hating on G. It's, it's like, not, like, you it's like be, we wouldn't be settlers if we, did, if we liked G. <laughs> yeah. It's like a really prosecuting a campaign of settler colonial genocide <laughs> right now. Yeah. Oh my no, God. you're just a settler. You don't understand. Yeah, oh, yeah, they're helping them. If you, if you don't support the Chinese struggle against Uyghur terrorism, you are a settler. Okay. Yeah, I was about to All say, right, like, I've, how much I've gotten yelled at. You know what? But but uh, let's be honest about this for a second. These are all bourgeois adjacent politics. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. Even even yeah, yeah. even That's the true. weirdo Maoist cult stuff. It's all the same. It's it's actually it's about picking sides in bourgeois political battles of which we have no goddamn interest. Yeah, so, we have no stake. Do you know yeah, the people who are actually colonized have zero stake in what G is doing. Actually, like, yeah, maybe yeah. maybe Cuba because they help out some of the Native American. I mean, but like, yeah, they but have but a stake in deposing G so they can break up the concentration mm -hmm. camps that mm -hmm. they're in. Maybe right. <laughs> But well, like, I mean, like, yeah. that. but I mean, like when you when you when you deal with that here, like cu like Cuba's relationship with with G with like G's China is actually not as clear. They're they're, they're kind of on yeah. their own in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Like on their uh, own. But, right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like when you when you look at all this right now, I mean, I don't I don't want to make this uh, like a referendum on on people's stances on China because I also think there's a lot of reactionary hatred of China that's like yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's China, scary. China, 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 and a lot of. We Bad propaganda on China too. The people, yeah. Do. Oh, it's so bad. Okay. I mean, honestly, okay. it makes it's one of the reasons why I think some of this, this, this like mm -hmm. pro Chinese stuff has an appeal is because some of the propaganda's yeah. gotten so lazy. Like yeah. it's just like it's like, come on, man. They're, they're, it's not that bad over there. But the the stuff with what you get thrown at is like you know, say what it seems to me that we're not that we when we look at the left right now, 
is in response to the delusions of the bourgeoisie, we have retreated into our own delusions. Yeah. I'll tell right. you what it is, Derek. It's a, mm -hmm. it's like you're drunk. It's the end of the night in the nightclub. You're messy as fuck. And oh, you're you trying go. your best to score with anything that has got any movement at all. <laughs> That's what's going on. You're on the floor. You're the last one left. And you're just like trying to chat up a pillar or a fucking <laughs> door man. Like whatever the fuck. That's what's going on right now. That's what the left is doing in all these different Western countries. I think, I think sadly, Tom, you That's are absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty accurate. Yeah. I was like, this is going to go bad places, but you know what? Yeah. That was a hundred percent. on point. pretty accurate. We should probably get back to the text. I'm sorry to bring settler <laughs> colonialism and she into it because you know, uh, no, but sorry it's, for interrupting you, Derek. Sorry for interrupting you, but I just, no, that's no, that's great. That's true. No, it's good. It's very no, good. I, I, I think I think if there's one thing I could say about this is that that <laughs> comment about the the labor struggle, the Corbyn struggle being a struggle of a generation, I think kind of makes sense in a way because I think our generation is just going to be like on the left is going to be brain broken for right. a good while after the Bernie Corbin moment has collapsed. Like yeah, doing doing stuff. just bizarre shit because we can't handle, we can't process it. It was like, okay, Occupy failed. Let's become social Democrats. That's going to work. That failed, question mark. And, and, and then we end up exactly where Tom described. Yeah, I, 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 do, I think that like the communizer that you quoted there, Esri was right for the wrong reason, because I think mm. it probably was the UK's generation's like mm. battle for maybe the next 10, 15, 20 years. But that's the sadness of it. But I think but that's probably it's, true. It's, but, but it was the kind of thing that like as late as End Notes 3, they would be mocking. You know what I mean? They're, they're mocking the, you know, the working class that only has their hands in their heart, you know, and that sort of like labor kind of ideology like of class that would you know, tie itself into the party. Like it, it was a big part of the, you know, appeal of communization is its mutual derision of social democracy and Leninism. And it was just, you know, I don't know. I found it, I found it revealing and troubling. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's yeah. a correspondence I really need to get back up on because I hope nope. he's doing all right. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. <laughs>